You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. And I imagine for Paris, it's probably, well, I don't know what this person's about. I've never met this person. Um, but after a little while, obviously, you get to know everybody. And I got to know Tyson more. And if I'm honest, I used to look across and think, I don't know if this is possible. But I got to know him, got to know the family. I thought, but if I can make this man happy again, that's it. Even if he doesn't box again, I've done a good job. A fucking good job. And... He was all over the place at first. And the same thing happened in, in, for the last knockdown. He dipped down, didn't smother or step back, just dipped, thinking Wilder's going to punch six foot past. But by this point, Wilder had anticipated he was going to drop down there, boom, boom, and caught him on the way down there. I was thinking at the point, why? I was thinking to myself, God, why? Why have you took us this far to then do this now, you know? And then the whole get up thing, I just feel like that was just meant to happen. It was like the whole story of, I got knocked down I got back up again about his whole journey and then it actually happened in a sporting moment in the fight and that moment will forever go beyond sport because it's just a sign of he didn't just sit there going yeah if you get knocked down get back, you got to get back up you got to fight on like it actually happened mm -hmm. he said it and he did it and mm -hmm. for so many people like I've got thousands and thousands and thousands of messages of, type of people saying um, I took so much inspiration from that it's that that moment in boxing saved my Lives. son's life. Yeah, yeah, one million percent it did. I know mm. for a fact it did. And I've spent time around him, spent time around his family. Never have I heard him even discussing all this stuff that they talk about he's supposed to allegedly be involved in or used to be involved in or whatever. Like, it's just, they got the complete picture of what he's supposed to be and what he's like is just night and day. He's a good man, good heart, um, in it for the right reasons, in it for the boxers his interest isn't well if I get in that fight I'm going to get a good payday out of that or this that and the other like I know because I know that he's done it he would lose money to give someone a, an opportunity that you know he thinks they deserve because he's in it for the right reasons Ben, we're on. Today's <laughs> guest, we've got Ben Davison. How are you, bro? Oh, good, thanks, you. Thanks for coming on. No problem. 28 years old. Trained some of the biggest fighters on this planet. Josh Taylor we've got in now. Billy Joel Saunders. Tyson Fury. Mega names. I've just come in there and we've seen Josh. So, shout out to Josh. How are you, first of all? Yeah, I'm all good, thanks, you. Killing it, mate. I feel as if we spoke earlier, but I feel as if you've been in the boxing game for years and years and years. You won your first world title at 24 years old. Uh, was it done my first world title fight, which was a defence of a world title at 24. Um, but even before then, I'd worked with Billy Joe for quite a while. Did you? Yeah. And I've, I've worked with some of the names there, what I'm known for being a head coach, but mm -hmm. I've had, actually helped and assisted quite a few other big name fighters as well. Yeah. Like behind behind the scenes. But it's some track record for being only 28. And you must have clearly get these guys trust to be working with them. Just shows you the kind of character you are. But I always go back to the start with my guest brother, yeah. where you grew up and how it all began. I grew up in a place called Broxbourne in Hertfordshire, uh, which is a really nice town. Um, we lived in a council house, um, but I, I, I only have good memories. Um, I know the story most people love to hear is I grew up in a rough, tough, you mm -hmm. know. But um, I think everybody growing through and coming through life, they have their troubles and this, that and the other. But you know, where I grew up was a nice area, good school. Uh, my primary school was a good school, secondary school was a good school. And I only have good memories. Um, Lucky mom, bastards. Yeah, but, but I think, I think you know, I think it's just very easy and common to say, you know, I grew up, it was tough, it was this, it was that. Mm -hmm. Of course, everybody has things, tough moments going through life and growing. Um, Probably the one a big experience for me was my mum and dad parting ways at a young age. Um, but again, you know, I, I still only have good memories of. of How old up. were you when that happened? I think I was about nine, something like that. Um, my brother was a little bit older. He took it quite not so well. Um, and you know, he sort of went through his own troubles from that. Whereas I just, I think being a little bit younger, you don't fully understand what's going on. Um, 
So, you know, we sort of both went our own p different ways, but he got found himself back on track, really. What kind of path did he go down? Was he drinking, taking drugs, partying? Y yeah, that sort of stuff. Not to an extreme level, yeah. like, but was swaying off in the wrong direction. Um, and then sort of found himself getting back on did the track. Did you see this at a young age? Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, and people sa people always say to me, oh, you know, you've you got an old head on young shoulders, this, that and the other. But I think these experiences, seeing these experiences and having an older brother um, definitely helped me almost go through things before my time or before I should have. So I've always felt like I've been a little bit um, more mature mm -hmm. than than the average person of my age. How old, what's the, the years between you and your brother? Four years difference. What age again when your mum's dad's put up? How old were you? I think I was nine, so he would have been 13, something like that. And how was the relationship was going through the years with your mum and dad? Were you closer to one than the other? Um, I'll, I'll close to both, but probably mostly my dad. He spoil you? Not spoil me, but he was very, he was very, this is the way, there's no, ifs and buts like that's what you do and I, one saying that always 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 it I mean I'd be shocked if half a day went by and he didn't say it was um, if you do something you don't do it half-hearted never do anything half-hearted and you know that's sort of been that was drummed into me do you think that's helped you though becoming a boxing trainer yeah definitely because I think it's a case of that it's not for me I find that a lot of boxing coaches you know, they treat it almost as part time. Do their work in the morning at the gym. They go off or do something else or whatever. And t the boxer, okay, go and have a run tonight. But for me, it's like it's not even a nine to five. It's twenty four seven. I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm like, right, we need to sort this out. And how can we go around getting that better? And you know, it's just twenty four seven. Which yeah, is intense. Drives me crazy. But I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah, because I've just come out of the gym and you're watching footage of Josh Taylor. Yeah, and going back through some some. Some of some bits of other fighters, some bits of his old fights, uh, to say, look, when you do this, this works out. When you don't do this, this happens because of mm -hmm. here's this fighter doing that. Can you see the difference there? Yeah. So you pick up on a lot of things that maybe nobody else would see. Yeah, so they say. Um mm -hmm. but I just think again it boils down to that. You know, I don't do my bit in the work and go home. I, if I get a bit of time I'm studying fights, I'm watching, we're working on this, working on that. Um, watching back the sparring this happened because of this pick out some moments send it over to Josh what age did you start getting into boxing Ben? well my dad boxed as an amateur so I think like most people involved in boxing they um, they sort of before the ki lads come walk putting gloves on them and straight away so I remember um, you know before before I could walk there's videos of my dad putting some gloves on me and holding some pads I remember my first time going into gym, I was probably nine or ten or something around there. And I can remember it, walking in the gym and the guy going, uh, have you have you, have you, have you, done a bit of boxing before or boxed before or something along, along those lines? And we went, no. As in, you know, not been in the gym before, but I'd done a bit with my dad, but I didn't say this. And straight after Jimmy come over, straight after the training, he come over. And started laughing. I thought you said he's never done anything before, you know, because my dad had, like most boxers, chucked the gloves on their on their mm -hmm. kids and that. Did you find a passion for that then at that age? I did. I always loved doing it, but football at that time in my life was like everything to me. And I think I was about thirteen, you know, like what I was saying about my dad, don't do anything half hearted. He basically said to me very early, like, You've got to make a decision, what do you want to do? Make a commitment to football, make a commitment to boxing if that's what you want to do. And at the time, I thought, right, okay, I want to play football. I was okay, wasn't bad. Better players than me, worse players than me. Middle of the road. Um, but I just feel like everything sort of happened as it should. Um, because well, I'd said, okay, I'm going to commit to football. I was still training and boxing and going down the gym. Um, but not like I would if that was my chosen sport and was fully committed to all that. But I come across a... I started playing at Stevenage in the academy for Stevenage Borough they were at the time Stevenage Borough and there was a coach I come across there a guy called Colin Reid and most of my philosophies and way of coaching actually come from a football coach he would start the game stop every couple of minutes be like 
if you do, you've done this, yeah, why have you made that decision? Mate, you answered and you go, okay, what about if you've done that? Or you've done that? Or if when you do that, he goes there, then you'd play there. But we'd break it down so simply, it's like, you know, it's so dumbed down, but so tactical. I thought to myself, that this game's easy. You know, this is, when you just keep it simple and do the simple stuff really well, it's a very, very easy game when you're focused on the tactical side of things. And uh, very, very early on, I thought, he's got, some, he's got something special, this coach. And I always thought, I always had this passion for like coaching. Even when I'd play football, I was thinking, if I was putting on the session, I'll do it like this or I'll do it like that. Or, and I always thought, if I do get into coaching, that's the type of approach that I'm going to take. Do you absorb all that information that you get taught for such a young age? For me, I didn't listen, yeah. so I didn't listen to anybody. But you seem to be the kind of guy that listens and then puts your own spin to it to then absorb that like calculated kind of mind, like seeing things differently, not just a case of kicking a ball or with the punches and. You're seeing things technically, like you just says there. How, when did you realise you start having that kind of? Do you know what? When thoughts? I was playing football, like I said, I was probably middle of the road, but I was desperate to be the best. Like, I really anything that I do, I want to be the best at. And the way he, this is where it all started with his coach. And so I started thinking, okay, and he talked very much about positions and tactical and decision making and these kind of things. And I thought. Okay, so I started going back and watching games, but I'd watch the whole game and watch one player for a full game, go back, watch another player for a full game, and just look at where are they in that moment of the pitch, when the ball's in that part of the pitch, where would that be? That's where it started. Then I started taking that across to boxing, and um, I basically took that philosophy into boxing. Like we, we were talking before, and I sort of said, you know, every boxer can throw a jab, or a right hand, a one-two, a one-two, left hook, a right uppercut, a left hook to the body. Every boxer can throw every shot in the book. So clearly that's not what separates the good from the bad, is it? It's the stuff that happens in between the punches that makes a difference, I believe. Like what? Like, it sounds absolutely mental, but by doing certain things, you can determine when your opponent punches. In certain areas, you can determine what hand, probably more realistically, what hand your opponent throws with. Um... I call it asking a question. I can ask a question and find out what the opponent is looking to do before he thinks he's told me um, or before he does it by using different tools um, along the way that happen in between the punches. Otherwise, if you constantly got a punch to keep someone off you or constantly got a punch to keep yourself in the fight, well, the other opponent can punch, can't he? So it's 50-50. Many amateur fights did you have? I had a few. Um, did you win? Yeah, won them all. Uh, did you? Yeah. But I never achieved nothing, never, you know. No buzz on it for you? If I'm honest, no. I genuinely didn't. And I thought to myself, like I used to get more of a buzz of me and Billy Joe was in the same gym, so sparring with Billy Joe. I used to spar with James DeGale. And I used to think to myself, like that would, I'd get a bit of a, a buzz out of that. And that's where, where really where the coaching started, um, sparring with Billy Joe. And who won? Sparring sessions. He obviously would. And that was part of the reason why I thought, you know what? Like, I could do okay for three, maybe four rounds. Um, Did that dishearten you if you're getting... Yeah, definitely. If you're sparring and somebody's 100%. always getting better at of the you. Time we was, but you're fighting with some of the best the time, you don't know fighters that. on the planet. You, know, you don't know that. At the time, mm -hmm. he wasn't already a, a world champion. Um, it, it's probably more so the end of his amateur career or early part in his pro career. You knew he was good, obviously. But it, it was dishearten it is disheartening because you think, mm, after three, four rounds, it was just like he'd completely take over. And again, same as football. I was okay, middle of the road, wasn't the best, wasn't the worst. Like, it's so easy for, for a coach to say, and I just think he's so disrespectful. Um, and I find this as well, actually. I was having this conversation with Josh the other day. Like, Josh has an amateur pedigree. Like, But I find that there's a lot of lads, not to say it's not a good achievement, but of course it is, but they have win titles as a junior and do this as a junior. It's so easy for lads to go, yeah, I could have done this. I could have done that as a pro boxing. And uh, it's just a different sport. Like the other day, Willie, Willie Hutchinson, good amateur, um, got beat by a guy that come off the white collar scene. Like, Whereas Josh, he went to the Olympics. Billy Joe went to the Olympics, um, achieved things as a senior. Like, I think that's something to then talk about. Does that help a boxer before they go pro, winning Olympics and stuff like that? 
Because I know a lot of boxers never went through that ranks, not won, exactly, Brit not won British titles, not won Olympics, but went on and won worlds. Exactly. I think I just think it's I think it can help, but I also think it can be a hindrance. Um, especially when they have too many amateur fights. I think they get used to the free threes and such a higher pace or even before that, at one point. I think Beijing Olympics around that sort of area, they changed it to four twos. Um Yes, I had Luke Campbell on. I think he's won over 150 amateur fights. I think he's got one of the best amateur records in the UK, if not the world. It's unbelievable. It's a lot of fights. It, and I think that can be a hindrance, mm -hmm. in my opinion. But I also think that it's so easy for coaches, and again, going back to this Colin Reid coach. Um, you still friends with this guy? Do you know what? I've tried to touch base with him a few times. Um, I would love to sit down and have a conversation uh, with him again. Say that you've stole his methods. I haven't seen him for years, <laughs> yeah. And he... I remember him getting everybody around and going, now there's one reason why I didn't play for England in my football career. And everyone's thinking, oh, he's had an injury. Oh, he's this, he went, I weren't good enough. And I just think that's the case. And I think it's so easy for people to go, oh, I could have done this, but I had a bad back. Oh, I could have done this, but I had a bad knee. Like, I just I just think in professional boxing, like, for you to go, oh, I could have this, oh, I could have that, which would be easier for someone like myself to do that. But it's just, it just shows a complete lack of respect and understanding of the sport because professional boxing is ridiculously hard ridiculously hard yeah and when you're aware of what it actually takes like i would never disrespect boxing or disrespect people that have gone on to achieve things boxing um by saying things like that you know if you've seen a boxer training sparring would you know straight away if they've got something or does it take time do you know that instinct okay he's got something do you know what i can tell someone before they even spar I'm confident in my ability to, to teach someone what they need to, to, to be taught. Um, it's, if that a willingness to learn, I know I can do something with him. doesn't matter what his skill set is before. Has anyone ever surprised you? In terms of? You're not thinking, don't think they've got it, but then kicked on? Um, I've had the opposite where I thought, mm, he could do something. Not me coaching them, mm -hmm. but seeing them in the gym and thinking he could do something and it not happening. And I do boil that down to to um, to coaching, you know, and the yeah. level of coaching they're getting. What age did you start then with getting into coaching? I was probably about 17, 18, That's something like that. That's fucking young, Ben. As a coach, is that young ever? No, nah, probably not really. So what kind of, when you're coaching, so when you're coaching now, 28, so when you're 24, how easy, is it easier or harder for somebody that's older than you to take orders or take I think at first it can be. So how how I sort of got into it was I was doing this sparring with Billy Joe would do six rounds, could do all right three or four then, but he was he was probably boxing more rounds than this at that point. So he'd say afterwards, oh, I'll do a bit of pads. Um, actually, the first side of it was I went down a gym to, to get better condition, focusing on my football at this point. I must have been 15, 16, something like that. And the the, the gym's actually more of a boxing-based type gym. Um, and I went down there and it obviously went there for football, never mentioned anything about boxing. And he went, right, we'll do a bit of pads. And I don't think he expected me to, to do what I could do at the time. And... I built a relationship with this guy and he sort of said to me, look, I'll put you through your training qualifications. So if things don't work out for you, like you got a job here type thing. And I thought, okay, that sounds good. So I did that. And then Billy Joe used to train at the gym as well. And, and uh, he started c coming down. So we'd do six rounds or whatever. Then I'd do a little bit of pads after. Then he'd text me saying, can we do that again tomorrow? Can we do that again tomorrow? On the days that we're not sparring, can I come in and do a session with you? Then that just kept growing. Then he sort of texted me one day and was like, what do you think about being part of my team? And I knew at that point, I thought, I can see things outside the ring that other people can't see. I just didn't have the experience and the knowledge to fully explain it in the way I needed to. And I think that's a huge part of coaching, how I get that information across. Um, and I just, as time went on, I got a little bit better at that. And then you can start to, so I was working with him sort of more so behind the scenes and then Started picking up one or two other fighters, and it just sort of snowballed from there. Who did you look at for inspiration, role models wise? Did you have any other trainers you thought they've got results over the years? I want to kind of model myself on them. Yeah, sort of along the lines of what you said before, where you went, you seem to be the type to absorb knowledge in something that I'm interested in. Yeah. And with the boxing, 
I sort of went around, I worked with so many different trainers myself. And I used to think, he's good at that. He's good at that. He's good at that. He's good at that. But none of them has the whole package. And I sort of went, okay, I'll, I, like, I like the way he does that. 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 And sort of picked little things along the way, of course. And then obviously with experience, you sort of develop your own philosophy and the way of putting things across. But even to this day, uh, someone said to me the other day, when was the last time you feel like you actually learned something about boxing? I said, every day I learn something. More so, that fight gets, I get a re better response by demonstrating. I get a better response by him seeing it visually on the screen or he gets a better response by just drilling it. He gets a better response by, or even explaining it. He takes it better on board when I explain it like this, when I explain it like this. And... So every day you learn like that, and like I said, I just think that's a huge part. Yeah, to keep learning and growing in your craft, man, it's all about knowledge and gathering information, stealing parts. It's model image, steal who's doing what you're doing, take it, put your own spin to it. But if you keep learning and learning, then you create your own journey, you create your own science of the madness, I believe anyway. Yeah, definitely. When you won the world title, when you, you're coaching for somebody who won the world title at 24, was it Billy Joel? Yeah. At 24, how were you accepted? Was there any well, it was question a bad marks? performance, but I actually took over probably three or four weeks before and he was really struggling with his weight. I'd been working with him the whole way through, so I sort of knew what position he was in. And my thinking at the time was, he can't afford to win these rounds big because he ain't got the gas tank for it for this fight because he's, he was really struggling with his weight. Um, and I know what he's like. So I remember he come back to the corner. But again, people are thinking 24-year-old probably doesn't know this, doesn't know that. He lost the round, but he come back to the corner. I purposely told him he won that round on purpose because I knew if I told him he lost it, he would have come out and worked so hard to win that round. So um, I purposely told him that he won the round just to keep him calm. And I already had in my mind, I, I know Billy Joe personally before going into this fight, and I thought I know how to get what I need out of him. But it was about picking the right moment. And this guy that he was boxing was not the most, not experienced at that level. And I thought to myself, one, we can't afford to shoot our tank too early. But I know he's going to have his own doubts of doing the rounds at world championship level. So I thought around that mark when that question starts to usually come in around rounds eight, rounds nine, that's when we need to push the pace. him Because I know what he'll start thinking. He'll start having doubts. Can I do the pace? Can, have I got four, five, six rounds left in me? So I thought if we can save his energy and use round that seven, eight, nine to really push on, then those doubts are gonna creep in the other guy's mind and we can sort of control the pace from there on out and use that guy's doubts against him. So it was about, the importance was mostly round management and also, you know, Billy Joe wasn't, he was seasoned, but you know, it was his first offense of his world title, first fight not working with Jimmy Tibbs. And I thought, I don't wanna completely change the, the way he's used to being communi communicated to in the corner. Um, but people would never think, oh, 24 years old, he's thinking about these things. Um, was there all a question marks on your ability to get into that fight? Uh, afterwards, because it, wasn't and a, afterwards? Yeah, because it wasn't a great performance from Billy Joe. But I think it was easily, a, not because of the opponent, but because of the way he'd done his weight, um, it was definitely a potential slip up. It could have gone a lot worse if he wasn't economical and efficient. Um, but I always had sort of confidence in in my ability. And yeah, why do you think Billy Joel performs better when he's underdog? Um, he seems to pick. He seems to. F I don't know all that when he's. Well, put it like this: If you was to do a hundred meter race against someone that you know you can win at. Mm -hmm your own specific time of what you recorded when you know you can win that race quite comfortably would not be the same if you thought, I don't know if I can beat this fella in a race. I guarantee your time would be quicker Improve. against the guy that you thought, hmm, I'm not 100% sure I can win this race, so I need to. Do you see that by a lot of boxers if they know they're going in favourite? Even does their work rate slow down? Even with sparring, I say this to Josh, because they've got the big gloves and the head guard, there's just a lack of respect for... Sometimes it just almost switches off as a case of, because uh, it's not that respect. But when you get in there and they've got eight ounce gloves on, it's, I'm not giving this fella a chance. So how do you plant the seeds in their mind to pick up the pace? Um, is there a kind of mind fucking in there? Like, 
Monop- there can be with some things, but I also think it's just a case of like what's actually happening doesn't change. How you feel doesn't change what's actually happening. It's so easy to go if a boxer doesn't have a performance, good performance, um, to go, oh, I was weight drained or, oh, I didn't this, oh, it was this, oh, it was that. Okay, all of what you're saying is great, but that's how you feel, what actually transpired and happened in the ring. Um, so I don't really focus on how somebody feels. I focus on what's uh, actually happening, you know? But Billy Joel, man, phenomenal fighter, I believe, and <laughs> absolute animal. And I've seen photos there just yesterday, and he's the best shit I've ever seen him. How does that make you feel to seeing that somebody you've knew your whole life then fighting the biggest fight in his life? And I know he can win that fight. I believe so. I believe so. Reason being because I believe everybody thinks he's the underdog and it, he's the kind of guy that gets pissed off, I believe, and to prove people wrong. I think there's, And I hope he does. He's a, he's a showman. Boxing needs that kind of guy. Just zero fucks given. Says how it is. I can clearly see with a smile on your face how <laughs> yeah. happy you are for him. Like, how is that when you see fighters going for that for the biggest fights of their life? How proud do you feel that you're part of that journey, you're part of yeah. his story to get him to that level as well? Yeah, of course, and I want to see him do it. And uh, I worked a lot of him in most of his fights, really, most of his title fights. And even for this fight, he come down to the gym and had a few days down the gym where we sort of went through, this is what I think Canelo's going to do, this is what I think you need to do. Um and then we've done some film studies for him, sent it over to him, um, just to say, look, this is my opinion, you know, this is what I think. And I think this fight's gonna boil down to who's better prepared. Not physically, not who's be- who's more fit, who's better prepared for the up. Because the level of IQ in that boxing ring will be a joke, ridiculous. Canelo's IQ is ridiculous, and Billy Joe's IQ is ridiculous. Um, so I just think it's going to be a battle of who is more tactically aware, who understands what their opponent's trying to achieve by what they're doing. One man's been defeated though as well. Yeah. That, does that play a part? Even though Canelo's... I don't think now. ...saying he's pound for pound best ever. But when I, you watch the Canelo and Mayweather fight, that why? Look, Mayweather, I believe, is the greatest of all time. In, in my opinion, I'm agree. not a boxing... My, I just love watching boxing. I don't know. I'm not a coach. But for me, for what he done, even what he done with Canelo, yes, Canelo was young, but Canelo couldn't touch him. For that man to have done that, it shows you the level that he was at. It's unbelievable. That like, Do you see like, how Mayweather can slip punches? Do you ever go, how the fuck does he do that? And then use that with your own boxers? Yeah, like, that's we was just watching Mayweather with Josh. Yeah. Um, but again, the thing is, it's so easy to go, what's the theme of, like, just go with the theme, like, Mayweather, oh, you know, he saw, oh, he was on his on the bike, moved against Canelo. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Because you, when you're saying this, you're not actually watching what's happening. Watch the Mayweather fight, first thing he does, step straight to Canelo. Doesn't give up. Like, if you look to do that against Canelo, your back won't come off the ropes after four rounds, four or five rounds. Whereas Canelo kept, sorry, Mayweather kept just enough distance. They didn't give ground away cheaply. You're going to earn it if you want to push me back. And if you're going to push, if you're going to push me back, you're going to commit to me. I'll make you pay for committing to me. How hard does that? Let's like, see a fighter loses, and you see how everybody comes on social media and just talking shit. Like you're talking about ring movement, and she's for the average boxer. Like, we don't know that shit. Yeah. We just see punches getting thrown. How difficult is when people criticising people who's never fought in a ring before? Does that piss you off sometimes? No, not really, because, like, there's guys that... I've got a guy that works with me. His name's Lee Wiley. He's not... He's done a little bit of, you know, boxing, but never competed. But he will blow away, hand on my heart, would guarantee it with everything I've got. He would blow away most trainers in the UK in terms of knowing what's happening. Um... And I just think that there's an, and I know guys that have boxed their whole life, clueless, absolutely clueless. Some of the best fighters that have ever been, absolutely terrible coaches, not a clue. Often I think that they're so talented that they've just done what comes natural to them, but they've never actually thought about what they're actually doing. Yeah, there's a lot more to it. Mm, what does bug me is when someone, you know, someone who's considered a coach comes out of some absolute nonsense and I think, <laughs> I, I, I think it'd be rude and just disrespectful and would come across arrogant to go, hold on and pull them up type thing. But even to say that, to pull them up, it sounds arrogant. I don't mean it like that, but I think that's just not what happened and I could easily go, 
Yeah, address the situation. Yeah, but I just don't bother. Yeah. What do you think then, Canelo Saunders? Who wins? I think, like, it, I say I, I say this all the time, like, it would just be, oh, you're a cheerleader if I went, Billy Joe, 100%, like, he's winning. That'd be ridiculous because he's of that level. Like, either guy makes a mistake, they're going to get made to pay for it. Um, I think 100% Billy Joe can win that fight. There's not a doubt in my mind. Um, but if he makes too many mistakes, he's too reactive, um, Canelo can win that fight. Of course he can. He's the best pound for pound fighter on the planet. If Billy Joe goes about it the right way, he wins that fight. But this is the first time that he seems on it. This is a fight he's been wanting his whole life. Now that he has it, it seems it doesn't seem to have affected him. He seems to be head down, working hard, and he's given himself the best opportunity that he can to win this fight. So if he wins this fight, then he's he becomes one of the best and ever in the UK, which is a phenomenal achievement for because if you beat Canelo then you've got to be on that. Even to be a two weight world champion, that says a lot, yeah. you know. But to beat the pound for pound number one, like, mm -hmm. you excited for that? Yeah, I just I Do you know. get nervous for that. So because you're not there, mm, that's why. When he boxes and I can't give him the information that I feel he needs, I get sickly nervous in my stomach. Why are you not at this one? Because you're with Josh. Yeah, really timings mm -hmm. and and things like that. Um, but like I say, we've discussed the fight. He's been down here and speak on the phone most days. Um. I get really nervous when I can't give the information that I feel like I need to give. But when I'm there and giving the information, I don't, I don't get nervous whatsoever, really. Do you feel like a father figure sometimes, like nurturing? It's not just a case of boxing. Do you have to deal with all the shit outside the ring? Yeah, with there, them? there is an element of that, um, and I think that you know because I'm younger, it can be easy for people to think, oh, the, the relationship or the dynamic must be different to what they have in their mind, but. I think that there is an element of that. You have to be able to read people. You have to go, okay, you need to kick up the arse or do you know what, he needs an arm around him. That's a huge part of coaching and knowing, do you know what, today's the day or he's in the mood today or this is the time to go. There's no beating around the bush like, boom, this is what it is, yeah. like it or lump it. But there's a time to go, do you know what, today's not the day to let it go. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll go for it or pull him up tomorrow or a couple of days down the line to go, look, the reason this happened was because of this or because of that. Is there a lot of tears in camp when people are going through eight weeks, 12 week camps? Depends on the Away person. from the I family think. and just the struggles. I don't think people realise actually what goes on to prepare for a fight. I've spoke to a few boxers now, man, and the strain. Like, just been away from family, but I think I spoke to Josh there and he's kind of just used to it now. Scottish blood, he doesn't really give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it must be hard to you for you to see that, to absorb that energy, to have to pick, pick up the spirits consistently. That like, It's not just an average fight, it's world title fights, it's the biggest fights on the planet. So how do you then get stressed or do you have to constantly put on the shield that nothing phases you? That That's key, that is key. But even like every fighter's next fight is their world title fight. I can't afford to lose. That's the same for everybody. Well, obviously with Tyson, it was very different because there was so much up and down and head was all over the place at the beginning. But like I was saying before, I feel like everything's just sort of that happened because of that and that happened because of that. I used to, um, I used to see a girl that she suffered badly from depression and like exactly what you're saying, they soak up the energy. I ended up suffering depression from that. I didn't realise directly at the time, but I was soaking up this energy and ended up being like that myself. And I used to think, why? Like, why have I ended up going through this? Then when I started working with Tyson, I thought, I know exactly why God put me through this because I'm now in a position to know and see the signs and know how someone's feeling, know what they don't want to hear in that moment. I could tell when Tyson was walking down the stairs what type of mood he was in. That was a difficult one. How did you start that journey with Tyson? So that fight that I was saying about when I done my first world title fight at 24, mm -hmm. fight week, Tyson come down for the full fight week and saw me doing some work with Billy Joe and I, he was a bit like, started asking questions and and uh, I think was just impressed with what he sort of saw. He knew before that Billy Joe was sort of down at the weights, so while people looked at him and went, oh, that was a bad performance, that was Ben's fault. He already knew the situation before the fight took place. 
And then we were sort of in contact and then me and Billy Joe went over to Marbella for a training camp. Billy Joe said to me, do you mind if Tyson comes over? I said, no, no problem. And when he come over, after the first session, he was like, right, do you want to be my new coach? And I was like, most people at 24, 24, or 25, one or two, 24, I think, yeah, uh, would be like, yeah, you know, 100%. I was like, whoa, take your time. Like, you don't have to rush into a decision like this. We can keep working. If you're happy with it, then we'll see. If not, you know, you don't have to. This was when he was 28 stone. Yeah. And he was actually a little bit lighter at the time. He gained some weight after this. And I sort of said, you know, you achieved a lot with your uncle. Like, you don't have to rush into any decisions. And then after a few sessions, he had already made his mind up, you know. Um, and then he had to go back. The plan was to, to go, for him to go back to England, sort a few bits out, then come back over and carry on training. Never happened. He went even heavier. Um, we was in contact bits and bobs, and he just randomly messaged me one day in the gym and was like, I'm ready, are you ready? I was like, ready for what? He was like, I'm ready to start. Like, I said, what, so you want me to, you want to commit to me being your trainer? He was like, yep, yeah, this, that, and the other. And I was up and had a fighter helping Tony Bellew at the time prepare for the David Hay fight. big guy. Love Tony, show yeah. Tony. And um, I was like, right, so I'm staying in Sheffield for a week or two weeks or whatever it was, I can't remember. I was like, I can meet you over at Hatton's, which is about halfway, um, to do some sessions three times a week or whatever. So we started off doing that. After a couple of weeks, he was like, look, I need to do this full time. So... Then I moved in with him and I remember turning up at the house <laughs> and uh, knocking on the door. I didn't know this at the time, but like probably a year down the line or 10 months down the line, I was talking to Paris and she was like, he never told me. He was <laughs> <laughs> Just knocked on the door. He was like, oh, by the way. Ben's moving in. Yeah. She was like, what? Uh -huh. uh, some stranger moving in. Like, Was she just happy though that it was getting help? It must have been a difficult time for seeing him. A big, strong man, king of the world. Klitschko. Won all the belts, had all the money, had all the fame, but then hit the biggest depression in his life. And I always use Tyson Fury as an example how when you achieve those goals and you think it's going to complete you, it's going to fulfil all the emptiness when you realise when you get it, that it ain't fuck all. And that's when people can slip. But for a man to come back from 28 stone and achieving, you're a massive part of that. So I take my hat off to you. I don't know if you get the credit that you deserve for actually what you've done and to absorb all that energy, to feel mm. those emotions and to go through that journey as well. Because when he's struggling... You then struggle, so it's then your job to give him that inspiration. When he was talking about getting back to fights and stuff, what were you thinking seriously when he was 28 stone? Were you thinking, mm, did you have doubt? Or were you thinking it's Tyson Fury? Like, his mindset is different. I see it, other people who see things see it. Like, when he says something, he means it. People don't necessarily get it. So when he was saying to you, I'm coming back, anybody else at 28 stone is thinking, nah, you're full of shit. What were you thinking? Yeah, at the time he had he had some doubts, and I remember sort of um, at one point he said, "I think this is the first time he's over in my bay." He was like, "My biggest worry is doing a comeback, getting myself back in shape, doing a comeback, just not having it because what is taken out of me this comeback and the inactivity, getting beat or something like that, and then people go, ah, oh, it was a fluke that night against Klitschko. That was like something I can't have that, so I need to take my time with this." And I imagine for Paris it was probably well. I don't know what this person's about. I never met this person. Um, but after a little while, obviously, you get to know everybody. And I got to know Tyson more. And if I'm honest, I used to look across and think, I don't know if this is possible. But I'd got to know him, got to know the family. I thought, but if I can make this man happy again, that's it. Even if he doesn't box again, I've done a good job. A fucking good job. And he was all over the place at first. And so... One minute it was I want to take four fights. Now I took the deal on, I took the agreement to do this on him having four warm up fights. Um, and then there was times where go, oh, forget the warm up fights. I, I don't love boxing no more because obviously it was tough. The emotions of going for a training camp, the emotions of having to lose all the all this weight, um, which was going to take time. It'd be like, ah, oh, forget the warm up fights. I'm just going to take a big fight. If I got it, I've got it. If I ain't, I ain't. And I remember sitting around the table actually with um, Tyson and Paris and he said something along those lines and I sort of finished my foot, put it to the side and walked into my room and I could hear through the door, he went to Paris, what's up with him? And she went, he's not here for that. He's not here to have one big fight and earn some money and go, oh, if 
you do it, you do it. If you don't, you don't. I've earned a few quid off it. What is it, Mal? And uh, he came in and went, what's up? I went, I'm not interested, mate. If you want to walk into what, I took this agreeing to four warm-up fights. I said, if you go, you want to have one big fight, like, I'm not the man for this job. I'm not interested. Like, I don't care. Oh, you'll earn a few quid. Not interested. Don't care. I know, I know I'm going to earn money because I know I'm good at my job. Um, and I think that for him was like, okay, like, this person's actually in it for the long run, like, and it gave him a bit of confidence in what I want. and Not just using them. Yeah, exactly. And the initial going through the business side of things to get the, the deal for the comeback and everybody wanted a piece of it. And Well, you've agreed to this before, but then I've still got one fight with you. I've still got a contract with you. All of this was causing him a lot of stress because you already had all the stress of this comeback, never mind all the stress of the business side of things. But once he got the... Once he got the um, the sort of the, all that that sort of things in place, then a lot of the stress and worry went away. But he he had a um, so his first bar, he was like, I thought right, get him a steady bit of spine, let him move around, nothing too intense, you know, let him get used to a few things, and he wanted to spar Lucas Brown. Someone phoned up about Lucas Brown, a bit of sparring, and I thought, rather him just move about. Not that Lucas Brown is great, but he can punch a bit. And I was like, let's just, you know, have a move about first. Get someone else. He, ah, I'll be all right. He won't be all right. Went back, sparred, timing, everything. Like, things that you would think would be off, timing, distance. He was just playing around. Like, everything was still there. And I thought, interesting. Um, and then as time went on, Inspiring more and more, but it was very up and down. And I think, again, a big part of my job, old head on young shoulders, people wouldn't expect that type of dynamic. My thing was, I sort of used to look at it as they're the guidelines. If he goes above that, I know he's going to crash. If he goes below that, not good. If we can sit him in between these two guidelines, quite balanced, like we're doing well. So there'd be moments, he's very easily influenced, Tyson, very easily influenced, like a big kid, really, at times. <laughs> and, um, like you just wouldn't expect someone that big achieve what he's achieved, such a character to be so easily influenced. But if you went, literally, I always say this: if you, if you, he went, I could run through that wall. It would start off as a joke, but do you know if I went, I think you can. All of a sudden, it'd be, <laughs> I can. He would actually believe it, you know. But I used to purposely do things like, he'd go, I'm strong, or this or that, messing about, and I'd go. You can't do 10 reps without weight. Here you go. Yeah. Watch mm -hmm. this then. And I'd get that extra step out of him. Um, and then there was, I was so, I found, I, I thought it was so important to get away from home, get into warm weather, get him in a good mood to get to Marbella. Part of me taking on this job was to, with the agreement that we were going to go away to Marbella to get him away from everything, just focus on getting some, crashing a bit of weight off early, giving him time to rest and recover from crashing the weight, let his body get back to normal then going to a warm-up fight. And he was a bit against the going to my back. He's out of your comfort zone. You know what I mean? He's thinking, I can do this from home. And I remember while we was having this discussion, we was getting ready to go for a run and the kids were screaming, oh, I want to come, oh, I want to come. I was thinking, this is why, you know? And we set out, but he lives along sort of the seafront. So we went out for a run. Crash, the wind and the rain and the, everything from the sea crashing in and the kids, ah, oh, scooters broke, screaming, got a mile up the road. I was like, look, this is why I'm saying we need to get away, like just fully focus on on yourself, get doing what needs to be done rather than this will end up taking 12, 14, 18 weeks when we can get big results out of six weeks and then calming things back down. No, no, no. And then all of a sudden he turned around, I booked it. Book what? We're going tomorrow. And I was like, tomorrow? Uh, yeah, and we're driving. What are we driving for? Ah, he's he's saying this to me. Don't worry about it. This side of of, of uh, this side, like England, will be the worst part of the journey. Once we get through to the other side, it'll be easy. I'm thinking, okay, get up in the morning, set off within two hours. Ah, oh, let's just turn around. <laughs> he's coming. I'm thinking, oh, you said to me uh -huh. this. this be, yeah, that's an 18 hour drive. Yeah, you said to me that England's going to be the hard part. And then once we got through to the other end, sorry, we stopped off at. Um, Stopped off at a petrol station 
And he sort of said to me, listen, listen I can only apologise. He went, I just, you know, let's turn around. He said, getting scared? I don't know what it was. I think it was just a case of the drive was difficult. Knew it was, it was, the journey was like the journey. The journey Even was... his kids and family as well. His missus is his rock as well. You know she I mean? was, she come with us. Oh, they come she? with us. But we was in was a the car. the kids there as well? The kids were there, yeah. <laughs> and he had, he had the little one at the time screaming every time we phoned through from the car. Yeah. So I was in a different car. And it was a bit like the journey, like the first, he had already said this to me, England, the journey part of England to get down to the, to the, uh, Euro tunnel was going to be the difficult part and I felt like you know the first stage of this comeback was going to be the difficult part and we got to I think we got across actually to France and he was like look I can only apologise I'll pay you, what you whatever you want for your time that you've put in he said but look let's just go he actually said let's just go to Disneyland for a couple of days then turn around and I was like I didn't come here for this like we're going to stick it through like we're going to get there oh let's see how we feel in the morning and Tyson's brother, Huey, um, I got out of the car, face like a smack Tyson. He was like, what's up with him? He was like, he's come to do what, what needs to be done. Like, we knew that this was ahead of us. We need to get there and get to work. And he was like, oh, I see how we feel in the morning. Obviously, woke up in the morning, better mood, got going again. Um, and I remember that as soon as the sun, this is my thing, get him in the sun, good environment, healthy, clean. I I think it's probably a lot cleaner to live cleaner in a warm weather scenario. And it'd be negative, 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 negative. It was almost like the sun, boof, hit the car, phone through. Oh, I can't wait to get there. <laughs> I was like, this fella's off his trolley. <laughs> and once we got over there, you know, it's uh, it really good results. Day to day, he was always up and down. Um, but like I say, the key was to try and keep him in the guidelines. Um, and then he had the two comeback fights. How was it his first comeback fight? Were you nervous? Because there was a lot of hype about it. Yeah, I, I think I sort of I sort of thought we knew what to sort of expect. Like it was more about the show, the event. He wasn't quite, if I'm being honest, mentally stable at that point. It was more about the event than the actual fight. Like the fight was never going to be competitive, you know. Um, but people love to criticise, you know, so people was expecting a barnstormer of a fight and it just wasn't the case. It was a comeback fight, almost a signal, you know, positive things yeah. are ahead. It's going to happen. How was it before getting into the ring? Yeah, good. one thing I say about Tyson is I, I think he probably feels more pressure fighting someone that he's just completely expected to, to be than he does when he's fighting someone that people are like, mm, I don't know if he can do this. Um, that must be that gypsy blood because Billy Joel's the same like, yeah. they up their levels tenfold that nobody thinks they've got those levels and they put that I feel as if they two are constantly proving people wrong their whole boxing career I don't think that, even though they get the respect off a lot of people but I think they should get a lot more for actually what they've achieved they're still being I think is it both 30 and all? I don't know they're both 30 and all. They're both, yeah. like, they're both are unbelievable for what they've achieved and and again, but when you watch the fights, like I don't fucking know, I'm not a coach, but you kind of see when it's the ones they expect to beat, they kind of take the foot off the gas a bit, but when it's against the big names, your Klitschko's, your Canelo's coming up, like they go through levels and the training seems to go through the roof, which is a good thing. But when you were there, because it always seems like a showman in the changing room, Tyson before a fight, showing off and that, was that any signs of that, the first fight, the comeback fight? Yeah, to a, to a degree, the comeback fight was... Like everybody wanted their face on camera and the change room was full up and it was a bit of a circus really, if I'm honest. Um, How does that irritate you? Yeah, because I think, well, nobody else matters. I don't matter. Nobody matters other than the fighter. I've always believed this. Like if you want to be the star, do the fighting. Do you know what I mean? Earn it. Um, so it was a little bit of a, but and then that was why I remember we sort of said, look, you know, the next fight's a bit more of a, not a competitive fight when he's at his peak, but during the comeback, lost a lot of weight, still had lost a lot of weight between the first fight and the next fight. You know, it was it was going to make it more of a competitive fight. That was against a guy called um, Pianetta and then Tom Schwartz. Schwartz, yeah, Schwartz. So you had Wilder, so Wilder was only the third fight, not the fourth? No, so the agreement was four warm-up fights yeah. and then... Um, even going into the PNF fight, it was like talk to this because Wild had come to the fight. There was talk of this Wild fight. I openly said, you know, I think, you know, not that he couldn't win it, but you was really diminishing the percentages, like making it more narrow than it needed to be. Why would Wilder take that fight? 
he thought it's a name I blow this fella away and got a good name on my record that's mm -hmm. what he thought tried to get get him in quickly you know? uh, looking from outside that you'd think it was a bit of liberty Tyson just coming back after three years two warm up fights and then to fight one of the best knockout artists man in the boxing game like he was no mug, do you know what I mean? But then, what was your training when they took that fight? What were you thinking? Did you ever try and stop that? Were you thinking? Yeah, I, don't, I openly said, like, this is a step... Too early? Yeah, like, you're just diminishing the percentages and making it closer than what it needs to be. And... He was adamant that he wants to do it, you know? This is this is what I want to do, and... Do you think that's the, the addiction habit as well, where... Not we spoke here. I'll try to constantly prove people wrong, but he his self belief that he can run through a wall. Yeah, he probably would. That do you think that's what he needs though? That the one that nobody thinks he could win because he's just came back to then make him progress and kick on and prove people wrong. Yeah, I don't know because right. that's a bit psychotic yeah. to then go. Well, fuck it. I'm going to take the undefeated fighter, knocked out everybody that he's fought. Three fights back after a three-year layoff. So in terms of boxing side of things, I thought you're making this a closer fight than it needs to be. A lot more. If you just take your time and have another fight or two, take more so time for your body to recover from the weight loss. Um, but what I will say, in terms of overall, I think it was the best thing that could have happened to him. Not the actual fight and the performance, but the pressure and the, okay, you know, I've got focus on what's ahead of me and, and the job that's coming up. I've got a goal rather than losing a bit of weight, got this fella that I can box, I know I can beat him, but there was no complete, I need to be 100% focused for this. Whereas going into the Wilder fight, I just think that that really helped his mind. He had a focus, had something he knew he needed to do, there was a bit of pressure on him and made him mentally a lot more stable going into that fight. And then obviously what happened in the fight just turned him into a megastar. Should have won the fight, man. Should've he should have won, won the fight. fight. I think that's because that. he was in America. He was always wary of that. Always wary of that. Um, and actually, it's funny because we was like arguing. We want an English judge. We want an English judge. We want an English judge in there. One American, one one English, and one neutral. But it was the English judge that scored it a draw. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a case. Of, yeah. um, Do you see a lot of that in boxing? Or like two mega stars fighting? Is there a lot of that kind of corruption with scorecards? It seems to be getting. Like worse, how, how someone can score that 116, 112 yeah. to Wilder, I just can't, I don't know how you can come to that. What were you thinking when Tyson got put down in the last? I genuinely thought it was over. Like when a fighter goes down, they're going to get up. Usually something is moving. They are moving, whether it's their hands moving, their foot's moving. He was just still. It took him four seconds before, boom, okay. I don't know whether he was out. I don't know if he was going, okay, take my time. One thing that, that was funny, in the prep preparation for that, he kept saying, and I'm so uh, adamant about this, he kept on saying to us, to the sparring partners, if I get put down, it's okay, I've been there before. I'll wait to the eight count, then I'll get up. I'm experienced. And if he hits me flush, I probably will go down. That reality... I think was why he was able to get up. I think it was a case of he'd said it so many times, it was subconsciously in his mind of if I go down, I'll wait for the eight count, and then I'll get up. And he'd said it so many times, I thought he was probably subconsciously, well, okay. Then the ref was counting in his face, and it was a case of now I'll get up. Whereas if he hadn't have been realistic with himself, he was confident but realistic. And that was the important part of if I get it clean, a good chance I'll go over. Um, what are you thinking then though if you're thinking he's won six, seven rounds in front that he's cleared that eight rounds and then he gets put in his ass in the last what are you thinking so at the time I thought to myself like, like there's people going oh you know at the time people was like oh he got the tactics right but there definitely was moments where he could have pressed the pace against Wilder but my whole thing going into the fight is I don't know what the fuel tank's got I don't know what the fuel tank's got we haven't had 12 elite rounds that he's fought, or we've not had four one white fights, picking it up, picking it up, picking it up, and I can go, right, this is what's in the tank. This is where we're at. I thought to myself, I don't know how he's going to do the round. So at times where he could have probably pushed the pace, I'm thinking we need to be safe here and gradually, because gassing out and standing in front of Wilder is not an ideal place to be at all. So for me, it was a case of we need to be efficient um, and control the pace, because I didn't know 
being completely honest, I can sit here and go, yeah, this, yeah, that. Like at the time, I didn't know if he had 12 elite rounds in the tank after the weight loss and this kind of things. Um, and I'd actually said to him in the corner, when you did that, like you dropping down to your right, you need to step in, drive your shoulder into him and tie him up, not just dip, because there's a chance you get caught dipping and get caught down there. I said to him this a couple of rounds, and that was why he got clipped the first time as well, because he dipped down rather than close the distance or dip down and take half a step back. He didn't adjust distance. He just dipped down and got clipped up the back of the head. And the same thing happened in, in, for the last knockdown. He dipped down, didn't smother or step back, just dipped, thinking Wilder's going to punch six foot past. But by this point, Wilder had anticipated he was going to drop down there. Boom, boom, and caught him on the way down there. I was thinking at the point, why? I was thinking to myself, God, why? Why have you took us this far to then do this now, you know? And then the whole get up thing, I just feel like that was just meant to happen. It was like the whole story of, I got knocked down, I got back up again about his whole journey. And then it actually happened in a sporting moment in the fight. And that moment will forever go beyond sport because it's just a sign of, he didn't just sit there going, yeah, if you get knocked down, get back, you got to get back up, you got to fight on like, it actually happened. Mm -hmm. He said it and he did it. And yeah. for so many people, like, I've got thousands and thousands and thousands of messages of, type of people saying, um, I took so much inspiration from that. It's that that moment in boxing saved my Lives. son's life. So, yeah, yeah, one million percent it did. I know mm -hmm. for a fact it did. It's phenomenal, man. And that's why he's so loved. But you've still got to get credit for the journey that you've went because he could have probably quit numerous occasions when you were there and he might never have been back in a boxing ring again. How did you absorb that? Were you going with a game plan then for... Okay, we've got four matches. How are you thinking with his eating and drinking? I don't know if he was drinking in, but were you going in the mental battle to keep pushing him? What was your plan? Were you just going in and winging it and seeing what you could do? Or did you have a strategy? Yeah, I did have a strategy. It was a case of, right, if we go into intense straight away, I'm never going to do it. Like, Maidana tried to make a comeback. From the training that I saw, I thought, like, you're training like you got a fight around the corner, like, three weeks out from a fight, but you're a million miles away, you're dropping a bit of weight. You don't need to do that because you're going to think, well, it's tough to do that for 12 weeks of a training camp. So never mind doing it for six months to get a bit of weight off. Um, so my whole thing was, he doesn't need to work that hard to get the weight off at first with how big he is. Then give him a little rest period once the weight comes off, let him get a bit of rest, let the body recover a little bit. Then pick up the intensity for the first training camp. And then gradually, like I say, pick up the opponent and the levels of the opponents as we went on to see wh where he's at and gauge you know, how his body's recovering. Um, but, you know, he, he, he took that while to fight soon. What about the the run? You took him to the mountains, we're going to walk up or something? But... Yeah, we, uh, there was a run, there was a run that we used to do in Marbella called the Istan Mountain. And I thought to myself, he was on a ketogenic diet at this point. And I thought to myself, we don't need to, run up it again intensity hasn't got to be mad at the minute like the boxers do that for their fight camp I'm thinking let's just take a walk up it one of the fellas can drive in the car walk up drive back down good workout but not too intense so he's got out of the car stretching I'm thinking whatever this lunatic doing a little loosening himself up boom starts jogging I thought it's going to last five minutes here and then he'll start walking anyway keeps going five minutes later I'm thinking it won't be too much longer keeps going won't be too much longer, keeps going. The whole way up, then starts sprinting halfway through. What I'm thinking, this fella's off his trolley. <laughs> eh? Got a few young lads around him as well. Then he's pushing them on. So I was like, right, we're at, we're at the top now once we was there. And uh, he went, is this where everyone stops? Yeah, I went, yeah. He went, the Gypsy King don't stop here. Then he went, we're going all the way up to the top. So he just had to do that a little bit more than everybody else. And I thought, there's something about him. Not boxing ability, but there's something about him in there up there yeah that's what separates the weak from the strong I believe though that that's how he's made the comeback that he's done to 100%. be the, the most spoke about boxer on the planet just now do you know what I mean it's a it's a phenomenal achievement and when you were going through that then when he fought he'd won the fight did that try and did that affect him because it seemed quite calm when it, it get called a draw he was very calm why is that was he just happy to be back yeah I think he thought you know what you know everybody everybody was like getting blown away in three or four rounds like that is it. Even his dad was like, you're getting blown away. He's going to get blown away. Like, shouldn't be taking the fight. I agreed. He was diminishing the percentage chances. Um, but I knew 
we ain't getting blown away. Don't get me wrong, if Wilder landed something early, it could have happened. Because if he hits anyone flush at any point in the fight, it can end. But I thought to myself, we need to land something substantial early to make Wilder go, you're not walking at me. Because Tyson can punch. He can. And he landed something at the end of the first round, as if to say to him, if you're reckless, you'll get clipped yourself. And that, we needed that. That was like, you better respect me and made a little bit hesitant, made him bite on the feints. Um, so of course there was a game plan going into it, but I just feel like that was all that was all meant to happen. The way the fight went, the knockdown in the end, the getting back up, the controversial decision, it all mm. then led to the top rank ESPN deal. Um, and that really took him to another level. Even though it was a draw, it took him to another level. Does that still burn you? It does, yeah, it does, 100%. Um, I'd be a liar if I said it didn't. But again, like I said, I just feel like it was meant to be. Did you rate Wilder? I do. I do. I did. I don't know what he'll be like now after that. I think he's broken now, but Potentially. Or he could think to himself, do you know what? He may be saying all this, but deep down in, in his own mind, thinking, mm -hmm. do you know what? I've got weaknesses I need to work on. I'm not going to let that happen again. Did you start to see Tyson pick up his face because he, he knocked out Schwartz, was it? The fight after? Yeah, so then he boxed Tom Schwartz and... Funny enough, what I was saying about when he's expected to perform, um, I think there was a case of this, my Vegas debut, there's a lot of expectation on me. And I think mm -hmm. he felt it. I remember after the first round, I went to take his gum shield out. Even against Wilder, he'd click out his own gum shield and put it there. Or sometimes he'd take it out and hand it to me in a fight. Like, he's that calm. There you go. Do you know what I mean? There's the gum shield. But against Schwartz, I remember trying to get his gum shield out. And it was like, I had to actually where he'd been mm -hmm. biting on it. Because I think, not that he was, it was Tom Schwartz, but the pressure of, I've got to perform here, like, people's expecting me to put a showcase on here. So the pressure's on for me to put a showcase performance on. And I think he felt that. And I remember I said to him in the first round, I was like, everything you're throwing is like, boom, boom, everything's heavy. Vary it, touch, touch, slow, but bang, and something substantial behind it. So the rhythm's constantly changing. Straight away, come out, switch it up, or touch, 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 bang, touch, bang. Rhythm was constantly changing. Just set him up, let him get comfortable with a nice, soft, slow, but, but, boom, something substantial behind it. And that was the difference, really. And then, and then blew him away. Um, and then. So that was your fourth fight, and then it was, what, is it Wallen? What, what's that guy after that? Otto Wallen. Yeah. Was um, that the cut in the eye? That was the cut in the eye. Were you nervous when he got the cut in the eye? Well, what first, the referee come over to me and went, it's been deemed a clash of heads. So I thought, okay, no worries. Three, two or three rounds later, they come over to me. Um, the, actually, it was the like one of the presenter guys. He come over with a mic and was like, how do you feel about the cup being deemed a punch? I was like, what? But I had to play it calm, you know? So I took a sip of my water and was like, well, if that's the case, you know, he's been shown the height and he's been given the best opportunity he can. But going into that fight, if I'm being completely honest, I expected a performance like that. I think he was just drained, tired, was training every day because of his mental health. But and then it's also was trying to have a social life, do his book stuff, like everything was trying to do everything, you know? And I thought, he's burnt the candle at both ends. And I remember he was sparring and I thought, he's tired, he's fatigued. Not tired as in, <gasps> but the body's tired. He needs a little bit of a rest. The energy drained. Yeah, but I thought, mm, not sure if that's what it is or he's just too comfortable. So I thought, right, I'm gonna bring, there was a, uh, I'm sure it was, he was an Olympic gold medalist, two-time European champion, something like that, big tall southpaw. I was like, I'm going to bring this fella in. I'm going to let him try. You know, for three rounds, he should be giving anyone last night. Because Tyson was in a position where the problem was with him, if he wanted to literally just palm people off, backhand them, turn them around, he could do what he wanted at times and make it easy for himself. Anyway, I brought this fella in. He knew what I was doing, you know, completely tuned the fella up as if to say not today. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> um... And, you know, go. I think there was an element of complacency, if I'm being honest. But that guy, was he not 20 and all as well? He was he undefeated, was. so he's he not was. a mug. No, he's not a mug. Mm -hmm. um, I actually said, before the fight happened, I went out to watch Ortiz Wilder. Someone sent me it the other day. One of the reporters went, I spoke to Ben Davidson earlier. He said to me that while in, you know, Wilder beat Brazil in his last fight, Ben saying that Otto wanted to, you know, dominate Dominic Brazil too wild and he was like oh we get some crazy guys in the sport well, what just happened Wallen just dominated Brazil um, like I knew 
he was handy enough. But there was a bit of complacency from Tyson, like wasn't following the, the uh, his meal plan and nutrition and wasn't doing everything to the letter. A little bit of complacency. I'd asked him to come over to my bar a little bit sooner. Um, and I think there was too much, too many people around, too many people. Like I said, he's very easily influenced. And there was too much of people blowing smoke up his ass, if I'm being honest. And then one of the guys actually went to me before, oh, um, do you mind if I, do you, what do you think if I, can I come in the corner? I was like, what? Um, you know, and I just thought that's the vibe that's being put around the, the training camp is kind of fellow that's not a boxing coach, not used to being in the corner. I was like, okay, let's say um, he gets a bad cut. And I look around and say, Do you can you get me the adrenaline? What's the adrenaline look like? Uh, I knew, I knew. Hand on my heart, I swear to God, I knew he was going to get cut in that fight. And there's actually a video of us saying it to the referee before the fight happened as well. And then I said, let's say he gets dropped 10 seconds before the end of the round, comes back on unsteady legs. Are you going to be, uh, uh, uh? And I'm going, can you get me this? Can you get me that? It just, you know, it's not a circus type thing. Is that when all of your rats come in when you start getting the superstardom again? It's Everybody wants a PCA. Usually what happens. But yeah, when he's fucking 28 stone, flat out. There was three of us. Nobody's there. That's the change. But why did you get a lot of stick after that fight? Tactics wrong, weight was wrong. Yeah, saying that his weight come down. Yeah. The whole plan was for him to be about 18, 18, 8, 18, 9. How does that affect you? Still like only 26, still a young kid. Then everything that you've done for the three years... Did that play a massive fact? What I like about you as, as well, Ben, is that you never bad mouth anybody. Yeah. You never. Everybody loves conspiracies and all the bullshit. The politics goes behind it. But no matter what you do, if you work with somebody and then if you go to another training camp, you never say a bad word. And that's genuine respect because other people talk shit. They get annoyed and they do their own thing. You you don't do that. But after that, were you disheartened when you you moved on? Was it you that walked away? Or was it Tyson? So what had happened is obviously got cut, got through the fight. And um, and one, but you know, again, said I said he wasn't sticking to his meal plan and nutrition, and he came in at eighteen one or something like that when the plan was to be eighteen eight, eighteen nine, something like that. And then it was my fault that he was coming underweight, but he was fatigued, body was fatigued, wasn't sticking to the meal plan, um, and the and the nutritionist's uh, plan. So he came in light, got cut was definitely drained before the fight, like five fights in the space of a year. That's a lot for anybody, never, never mind a heavyweight. Then put on top of that a 10 stone weight loss, like what do you expect? It's phenomenal thing? though, you know? that. that's unbelievable. What do you expect? And then, yeah, obviously the dad, John, uh, had criticised me, but realistically, the, the the thing with me and me and John was, we got along very well. And then there was a few things behind the scene there was nothing to do with the coaching and the job that I was doing with Tyson. How could you not be happy when, you know, you at one point you thought he was never going to make a comeback. Then people thought he was going to get blown away in three or four rounds by Wilder. Then he got this ESPN deal and all that happened. Like, And then he's had, what, a tough fight, got a bad cut. Like, uh, and then he criticised me on the TV. And then afterwards Tyson was like, my dad's gone to town on me and you. Uh, but listen, no one will ever replace what sort of what you've done. And what you've done for me um, and then he got the then what he got the WWE thing and we flew over for the for the wrestling and then a few things happened there not necessarily with Tyson but you know we had a bit of a discussion there and he probably didn't quite like it the discussion because it wasn't me talking about positive things it was me talking about a few negative things and that that was going on and then what I decided to do was, because obviously there was the, the, what had happened before, there was a case of, I thought, right, let me get everybody together in the team, go through every individual, what does everybody think, so everybody's happy with everything that's going to happen. So I held this meeting, but it was a case of meeting for people in the team, people that went away for the training camp, this is your job, do you think there's anything else that you should be responsible for, is there anything else you want to be responsible for? Um, this is so-and-so's job. Does everybody else agree with that? This is what I'm thinking for the fight. Does everybody else agree with that? And then I I went over to Wilder and Ortiz, the second fight, 
and he was in a bit of a negative mood at this point Tyson ah shouldn't bother going over there um, waste of time this that and the other but I got along well with Wilder's coach and after the fight I got the vibe from the way Wilder took that fight I thought I know what they're going to do they're going to try to start slow let Ty create a comfortable environment for Tyson to then boom basically not, I'm going to keep my right hand in my pocket let you get comfortable walk you in boom and from being in that fight week, that's what I learned. Just by me being there and a few different conversations, I thought, I know what they're going to try and try and do here. So I went back and said to Tyson, he messaged me back saying, um, I'm going to start fast then. And I thought, that could catch him off guard because he's going to expect you to get on your toes, go on the back foot. While I was thinking, I'm not going to throw much, let you get a little bit confident, then boom, out of nowhere. Um, and so I was like, look, I actually agree, I think that could be quite effective. But I think if it starts going through the rounds, you know, you need to do a bit of this and a bit of that and blah, blah, blah. So that's where the whole starting fast thing come from. Um, and then I went up, I was like, look, I think I can see, you know, you're probably not in a great place right now. Um, I think we should, you know, start doing a bit of training, even if it's every other day or whatever. And like, nah, I'm sweet, I'm brand new, this, that and the other. But I knew, I knew you weren't. And a couple of weeks later, or a week later, or ten days later, he was like, "Oh, um, do you want to come up and do a session?" Went up and done a session. And after the session, we had a bit of a chat. He had to make a couple of decisions, business-wise. I had to make a couple of decisions, business-wise. And at this point, I already knew that Josh was coming over um, to do some training. Billy Joe was there at the time, and. The plan was to always bring someone else in. Not that their their job is to take over, but to bring someone else into it. It's it's a big job and a hard job training someone like Tyson. Um, and then basically that conversation took place and a couple of business decisions had to be made. And I just sort of said, you know, I've got Billy Joe, another world champion and potential another unified world champion. You know, I basically, I, uh, but you know, it's probably not for me. Yeah, how hard was that for you? Did it you was feel, difficult. Did you feel, not used, but it must have disheartened you the effort because that's not just a case of doing a 12 week camp or an eight week camp. You moved in, exchanged the energies, trying to help mentally as well as physically. So it must have put a lot of strain in your own life because then you don't really have a life. Mm. You're living everybody else's life trying to help them so for going through that for three years two or three years whatever it was and then um, getting slated after that by his old boy um, that must have been a bit disheartening though for you yeah but I always think you know boxers get one career whereas coach gets lots of different fighters a lot, lots yeah. of different careers to work with so I never ever you know no fighter should go his dad always seems spot on as well with you listen to him talk and he's he's a kind of tactician as well kind of on the ball with certain things some things like the Tom Schwartz fight, I'll pick Tom Schwartz. I'll pick Tom Schwartz. I had a lad boxing on a German card. I watched him box and I was like, he's our man. Um, and he told me Tom Schwartz, the wrong opponent, should have picked Lewis Ortiz. So was there a lot of uh, bickering before uh, the build up between you and his old boy? Put it this way after the ESPN deal got made, it started to go a little bit that way. Um, and like I say, you know, like. I'll say this to people, Tyson Fury, Tyson Fury is one of my best mates, one of the loveliest people on the planet. His favourite thing to do, sit down, drink a cup of coffee, where do you see yourself in five years, is one of his questions. The other question is, if you had absolutely nothing, but you had a million pounds, what would you do with it? That's his two favourite things to do, and ask everyone around the table. And then each day you ask him back, his answer would be different, you know, a million mm. different answers. Um, but the Gypsy King's a persona, it's a character. Of course. Gypsy King's not my best mate, mm -hmm. you know? Um, he's just a character. Um, so I get it, you know, and the Gypsy King's fun to be around and for everyone, this is the guy that, you know? But Tyson, when he's being Tyson, one of, one of the best people yeah, on the planet. He speaks highly of you, man. He'll yeah. never forget you to the day he dies, man. Like, yeah. Change the guy's life. Obviously, to make changes, you must want to do it yourself, but with his mindset and the right guidance, 
you're clearly a genius at what you do as well, man. So, you, especially with working with the, the guys that you're working with now, but that would only enhance your career as well. Exactly. Even all know. the bullshit that happens, the politics behind it, it still enhances your career. Like you never ever broken, you never got angry about it. You just done your thing and moved on to the next thing, and that's the, the that that's what I believe the growth is as well because you learn a lot about yourself. Yeah, and I think people learn a lot about you. If I was to then go, oh, you know, this and this and this and that, like, nah, you just look better. Yeah, a hundred percent, and that, often that's what happened. You know, what did I lose out on? He earned some money, he earned big money for the fight. Like, like I said, I know. And the experience. I've got years and years and years. I know I'll earn money. I know I already knew that I was working with two two world yeah. champions still at the same And it's the experience you learn and the stuff about mental health and what a real tramp champion. But I mean does. missing out on that second yeah. wilder fight. Like How I did you feel with that? Were you nervous about it still, even though you weren't part of it? Yeah, I was, but like I say, I think that the starting fast was the right thing. I just think it needed to be done in the right way. And he did that. Like I said, like we were having a conversation before, like, I think we mentioned it on here, like, what's happening between the punches is more important than the punches. And there was a few things that, in this meeting I held with everybody, I was like, I think for him to do this, this and this is the most important thing that he needs to do. Like, his most dominant rounds before was when he did this, when he did this, when he did this. How did he push Wilder back before? By doing this, by doing this, by doing this. Um, but... Uh, Look, uh, see when you go deep like that, do you think about the moves? Are you thinking about yeah? <laughs> Can I'm you like, see that? Yeah, like you're going deep, man. You're thinking about like I don't know what your movements like a chess player or not. Yeah, I visualise it yeah. in my head. <laughs> you've watched that much boxing, you've yes, actually got right. it stored up there. I can watch like the lads. They shadow box, but while they're shadow boxing, I can see the opponent. If mm -hmm. that makes sense, yeah. like, there's no one in there. They're shadow boxing, but I'm like, if you did this, this would be happening. If you did that, that would be happening. Why does what you just did in that shadow boxing not make sense? Because if you did this, the opponent's not going to do mm -hmm. what your reactions were there or what your yeah. decision to do after. How do you hold pads for people at different heights from five feet seven to then six feet eight? What height is Tyson? Six nine. Six nine. How, so, how does your shoulders feel? How does how does your energy levels keep high? Like, how do you? What is your process? Yeah, obviously you have to hold the pads a bit higher. Um, but also st styles, what sort of style the, the, mm. the fighter is. Does that affect your shoulders? Are you still it can young? Do. When you get the timing, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Hands, arms, those kind of things. But the that styles would determine how you hold the pads. But I still think I'm a, I'm a, I'm a keen believer in working on your weaknesses. Everybody wants to work on their strengths. But if you're bad at doing this, let's focus on that. Mm -hmm. Let's make your weakness better. Let's strengthen that. So when you're in a situation where, like going into a fight, for example, if I was to go, you need to do this, this, and this, as if everybody's going to play out, everything's going to play out for you to, all you have to do is this. Is there going to be a case of your opponent wants to put your back on the ropes? Are you never going to coach on what to do when your back's on the ropes? Like, let's be realistic about the fight. If it's a competitive fight, there's going to be times that your back hits the ropes if that's what your opponent wants you to do. So how we work to avoid giving your opponent what he wants when your back's on the ropes, this is what we need to do. Let's focus on this. Let's drill that. So it's working on your strengths and your weaknesses. So How was Freddie Roach in your corner as well? He was in the Wilder fight, was he? Yeah, so we went to... How did that come about? We had a media day in LA when we was in the camp in Big Bear. Went down to LA, let us use the gym. And then Big Bear just wasn't ideal with the altitude and that. So... We moved back down today. He let us use the gym. Took him out for Saint Sweet. It was actually me who said, you know, he's been very hospitable for us and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I said to Tyson, do you think we should say to him about being in the corner? Like Ricky, that's how it come about. Ricky, Ricky let us use his gym and that kind of thing. Um, and Tyson's like, yeah, perfect, no problem. So that's sort of how that come about. You learn a lot from Freddie. He's a genius as well. Yeah, I wouldn't say so much because he didn't really get. Involved as much? Yeah, he didn't really get involved that much um, in in the training and the coaching. Um, For what he goes through and still kicks on is unbelievable as well. Unbelievable. So after Tyson then, then you've got Josh, Scottish boy, flying high, Ramirez coming up, biggest fight of his life, could potentially make him the greatest fighter Scotland's ever produced. How's he getting on? 
Yeah, so Josh, like I say, when I parted ways with Tyson, I already knew mm -hmm. that he wanted to come over and was going to have a bit of time with me, a bit of time with a couple of other coaches and that. Does that make it easier, knowing that you're going from one world champion to another? Well, I already had another world champion in Billy Joe at the time. Mm -hmm. um, it would have been Sun Camp, the three of them all together. <laughs> <laughs> um, and... So I knew he was coming over. To, he was going to come over for a bit of training. So he come over to the buy it was at first, um, and we'd done some training. Then he went and had a bit of spell somewhere else, and and then he was like, "I'd like to come have another week." So he come and had another week, and at the end of the week, he was like, "I've made my decision. I want to train here." Um, and then he's a he can be a hard one to figure out he's absolutely mad I say this to him all the time absolutely, absolutely, mad, absolutely mad. mad yeah but he goes why do people think I'm mad mm -hmm. um <laughs> <laughs> he's hilarious uh -huh. and you know it was a completely different way of coaching I think for him but I didn't want to change too much because he'd come like as a unified world champion so you don't want to go stop everything you're doing or change your training completely it was a case of Gradually, we're going to have to make adjustments because there's definite improvements that you can make along the way. Of course, there is. There's always improvements that you can make along the way. And even with his training, I like to do this one, like to do this, like to do that. So I was like, okay, we'll keep that in. Look, let's make an adjustment there. Keep that in. Make this adjustment there. For example, just one of the things was he was sort of doing his own sort of nutrition. I was like, you know, I think you need to get a, a nutritionist at the level that you're at. Yeah, but I make the make the weight fine. Well, nothing to do with making the weight really. If you make the weight fine, that that won't be a problem either. But will you be more fueled for your sessions? Will you be more effective at when to cut your calories? Um, when to focus on weight loss? When to focus on on fueling? And all of these things. You know, if each week, if each day you're more fueled, one percent better for your sessions over the week of a training camp 1% better each day you can get yeah 90% 100% just getting the grams right on your calories your carbs your whatever your fats and picking your moments yeah. of fuel for that session don't need too much fuel for that session you know all of these kind mm -hmm. of things um, how do you think he's prepared for the Ramirez fight yeah he's good he's very he's, he can be intense Josh and he's very much a perfectionist which is brilliant which I am but he'll focus if half for example if I'm saying to him let's focus on this at the moment that's our focus because I want you to do this in the fight forget everything else not interested in anything else we're not at a point where everything needs to blend together I'm not a, as the fight gets closer yeah but I'm not massively oh you need to win every round sparring I'm not interested in that if I want you to control a spar without throwing a punch I want you to be able to do that. Um, do you have a fight with? The, nah, not really. Yeah. I just think... Like, arguing? Like, if, oh, I'll arguing. Yeah, oh, like, um, fight not, like, sparring, like, fucking... Do you ever keep, like, go, uh, I don't pissed think... off with Tyson or Josh or Billy when they're not listening right and you've cracked up? Yeah. Or would they just fucking not? <laughs> uh, yeah, there's probably been times where I've been, like, had to say what I feel, mm -hmm. which has been negative. But, like, in terms of... Josh ain't really, you know, we're not... Personalities ain't to a point where it's going to clash. And the same with me and Billy Joe, really. And the same with Tyson. But there's been times where they, they might be, ah, oh, you know, this won't happen, that won't happen. But I never get uh, annoyed because it's a case of, I can watch that back. I can tell you already before watching it back why this happened, that happened, that happened, that you're focused on I'll give a shout out to Lee McGregor as well who's been training with you and yeah. Josh he looks as if he's up to his level as well after winning is it European he won now yeah he looks as if he's came on leaps and bounds once you surround yourself with winners and world champions you kind of know to get to that level you know what needs to be done and you see his videos every day hustling grinding he's hungry yeah and, and Lee's one where it's been a completely your style needs to change like that's just not what you need to be doing what you was doing before like you're an absolute physical monster, but you're going to give people time by standing off, to, off them and posturing. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's just, that's just, you don't need to be doing that. And I think there was a, there, where he's come out and done what he's done in a completely different style to what he's done so well, people's like, oh, hold on a minute. But the same with Lee Wood, you know, Lee Wood was 
much on his toes, moving about. And that's the common theme of, oh, Ben's a defensive coach. But even in the last four fights, Josh, first round stoppage, Lee, first round stoppage, world title, European title, Lee Wood, knockout, um, British title, and Shabazz had his first fight in 18 months, stoppage. So although I'm considered def defensive coach, only because I focus on defense, you know? Um, you feel as if your style's changing those you got older? But with each person, it's different. Yeah. You know, with each fighter, it's different. Mm -hmm. I just think I would never go, and I would hate it for people to go, he's a system coach. Like, if you go to him, he's going to make you box like this. Yeah. Like, the way that we've got Lee boxing, the way we're focused on Josh doing mm -hmm. for this fight, you know. Yeah. We'll touch on MTK as well with uh, Daniel Kinahan. I know who you speak out very frequently of in his defence, you, Billy Joel. Tyson Fury, obviously with the documentary being out from Panorama, it all seemed a bit one-sided. Every boxer I've had on from NTK has spoke highly of the the promotion, they get treated well. What's your thoughts on it all? And how hard is it as well when you get all that negative shit? It's just so cliche, isn't it? Like, what I think, how can people that don't know the person, they've only heard stories and accusations say, this is what this person is? Like, they are just using his name to keep themselves in the job if I'm being honest. Something to write about. Oh, might get a few views. Might get a bit of interest. It's an area that's focused on, let's, you know, focus on that. Making out it's for the benefit of boxing. How can you say it's for the benefit of boxing? Look how many lads he's given fights to, got fights for, opportunities for. Um, deals he's put together for fighters. Like, no one that deals with him has got anything negative to say about him. And I've spent time around him, spent time around his family. Never have I heard him even discussing all this stuff that they talk about he's supposed to allegedly be involved in or used to be involved in or whatever like it's just they've got the complete picture of what he's supposed to be and what he's like is just night and day he's a good man good heart um, in it for the right reasons in it for the boxers his interest isn't well if I get in that fight I'm going to get a good payday out of that or this that and the other like I know, because I know that he's done it, he would lose money to give someone a, an opportunity that you know he thinks they deserve because he's in it for the right reasons. That's why the MTK is flying, MT Global is flying, it was over 200 fighters now. Yeah, and you know, he's, he's, um, he's like a, an advisor rather than the MTK situation now, but of course, you know, he helps fighters get deals, puts deals together for fighters, puts deals together for MTK. Um, like he has done, you know, unbelievable things for boxing and for boxers. And it's okay going, oh, I've got to put this together for that fight, put that together for that fight, with the intention of I'm gonna earn this out of it, I'm gonna earn that out of it. He's just not bothered about that. Like, if you do good work, the results and the money's gonna come. Um, his focus is, I'm a man of my word. If I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. There's not many of them in boxing. Yeah, there's also a lot of sharks in boxing. Everybody try to fuck each other over. And if somebody's doing good, then I believe just leave them alone, let them do their thing. And if something gets bad, and if somebody's doing bad, they'll always, they'll always catch up on them anyway. So, Yeah, exactly. And all this, the, the reporters that talk rubbish about him, he's all, oh, he's bad for the sport. Like, bad for the sport. Have you seen, like, massive part in Tyson's comeback? Was that bad for the sport? Or was that amazing for the sport? Like, what nonsense are you talking? They're the people that you should be looking at. Um, I think there's a lot of jealousy involved as well. 100%. 100%. Um, it's just so easy to, to make out they're doing it for the worrying of the best for boxing. How do you know what, what's best for boxing? You ain't got a clue. That's clickbait as well, isn't it, for the press? They mention our name, man. That's exactly what it is. Do you know what I mean? It's, if somebody's trying to do good in life, what happens is they try and get mud to stick. But is that not a sign? Like for BBC name. Panorama to view that the other day. Mm -hmm. They did that because they thought people were going to watch this. And they did. Not all. Oh, let's worry about the benefit of boxing. <laughs> Do me a favour. That's not going to stop MTK from getting fighters. That's not going to stop If anything, watching face. it, talking about how he's, you know, what he's done for certain fighters, you'd think, you know, and other people that was on there that was talking, then, you know, if people start researching what happened, I think it's if anything, it's going to draw people to him. You know what I mean? I thought, <laughs> yeah, what sort of job mad. are you lot yeah, doing? The media's mad. But again, 
as long as people can keep their hearts pure and do the right thing. But if anybody's doing bad, people always get found out anyway. But I don't. The, the press can manipulate it. That's why I believe everything's always one-sided. People deserve their chance to have their say. And if big names like Tyson Fury, yourself, Billy Joel Saunders, Dan Tills, if they're speaking highly of somebody, then it's clear that maybe somebody's actually okay and it's just whatever they're... Exactly, and it's like... Bullshit. I know what it's like because I've, I've worked with the top three pound-for-pound pound fighters in, the, in this country. It's like, ah, oh, you know, it's because of this, it's because of that. Like, do you really think Tyson, Billy Joel or Josh are going to go, I'll train with him because... Whatever, do you know what I mean? They, they come and, and work me because they think, well, he can improve me because of this, this, and this. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm not just going to work with any old Tom, Dick, or Harry. Who would you like to work with, Ben? Is there any fighters you look at and go, I would love to coach him? Mm. Do you look at every fight you fight and say he should improve there, 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 and there? Yeah, like most. Like this is like if people, it's so easy for people to go. Do you ever message anybody? And and say, look, I've just watched one of your fights. I think you can prove in this, this, and this. Or do you think, nah, fuck that? No. So there was a, there was a something that I was really impressed by um, was I was in Vegas and walked in the gym, and Devin Haney come into the gym, and twenty years old, twenty one years old at the time, world champion, ten man team, punched the life out of these two sparring partners, and I'm soft hearted me, and I start saying to the sparring partner, look, what you should do is this, what you should do is that across the gym he went coach let me get some of that work come over and um, I basically said look I thought this I think this I think that um, blah blah and he was like dad come over here and I was like listen to what he's saying and had a conversation then a little while after he messaged me and we have some conversation and talk about f fights and things like that and straight away I thought to myself I know you're going to do something special because that hunger has got to improve and hunger to to learn and get better. Um, and I've had a few fighters message me like, rather than be direct, like, can we work together? They've been a bit beat around the bush. Oh, mm. what, what about this? What about that? Making contact and then it often leads into, the problem is I can't constantly go here, go there when I've got someone, fighters that are settled here. So sometimes they end up just doing like, analysis bits and, and things like that with fighters from uh, from over there but there's a guy that I really really rate and I've been shouting about him for a few years now a guy called uh, Jaron Ennis no, but where's he from? he's from America he's coached by his dad mm -hmm. um, but but wait well we'll wait but he's, I think he's going to be the next big thing in boxing as well yeah special special talent mm -hmm. special talent um he would be a good one to work, but like I said, coached by his dad. It's a bit, I find it a bit funny to say things like that because you don't want to be like, oh, let me name this person, try yeah, and poach yeah, him, do you yeah, know what yeah. I mean? So you don't but want you to, never know me. No, you don't, want to, you don't want to come across like yeah. that. But um, as well, I think it's important, like the type of people, the 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 personalities that you work with, like. Would you ever knock back a boxer? World title contender, world champion, if you knew. Mm, yeah, I sort of had to recently. Yeah, just because the dates didn't work with Josh's fight. Well, that made Tyson back in the day, but a loose cannon. But do you feel as if you've got that mentality where you could maybe change? Yeah, them? someone of that level, it'd probably be difficult if I'm mm -hmm. honest to go. Nah, someone like a Mike Tyson. Um, just being realistic. Um, but I've got a lad in here who's not. You know, his goal is to win the Southern Area title. But the type of person that he is, he's absolute heart of gold. Like, just pure, when you say heart of gold, it's, it's said a lot, but it's based on him. Do you know what I mean? He's an absolute heart of gold. Mm -hmm. And it will mean as much to me helping him achieve his goal of a Southern Area title as it would any world titles that I've won. How's your relationship with Eddie Hearn? Uh, yeah, okay. Like, we didn't, I never really had a conversation while I was training Tyson, but obviously spoke to him bits and bobs since then. He knows the score that sometimes you say things to draw attention to make it a bigger fight when it does happen and things like you know he's you know, so like, play the game yeah he? exactly and that's yeah. what he is does he is he really emotionally involved you know sometimes he's going to say things that he probably doesn't really mean but he's going to say it because it gets people talking and makes the fight bigger and that's why he could, could promote I've got a good relationship with Frank Warren as well yeah how's Frank he's been in the industry a long time as well isn't he I find him brand new good to work with um 
sometimes you know I reach out just to touch base how are you I hope things are well um, he's looked after me when I've done bits for Queensbury or work with fighters that he's, he's got or done bits for BT Sport um, I think if you're just a genuine type person like you're going to get on with most people yeah that's the best way man see if you fly straight you're going to build it's still a business at the end of the day this is your life so exactly. you want to be a good guy you don't want to take no shit but if somebody's phoning Frank or phoning somebody then they're going to speak highly of you I don't know many people in the boxing game that speak bad of you it's mm. all speak highly of you you're still young so it's unbelievable what you're achieving it's unbelievable the fights you've been in and the people you've worked with at such a young age like I says earlier I feel as if you've been in boxing for fucking 20 years because you've been in that many corners you're, Andy McCart <laughs> Josh calls him the boxing whore he is everywhere yeah doing his IFL stuff he's in, he's in mere boxing fights and actual boxers he's <laughs> everywhere it's, um, it's just in their blood it's just in their blood. It's been your blood that you just want to see results. You want to produce winners. Just before we finish up, the last three fights, we'll touch on who wins out uh Fury and Joshua. Um, I think, like, so what I don't really do is, like, predictions. Yeah. I think this person's going to stop that person. Mm -hmm. Like a fight of that magnitude, it just boils down. All big fights where both fighters are capable. Tactics. Yeah, that's what it boils down to. Mm -hmm. I think the fight's completely changed in terms of 18 months ago, two years ago, we would have said Tyson's on the back foot, Joshua's on the front foot. I think with what Tyson done on the front foot with Wilder, I think there'll certainly be an element, and both being big guys, there'll certainly be an element of, I'm not going to be physically dominated by you. And the other guy will think, well, I'm not being physically intimidated by you. So I think the first round or two could actually be an interesting one if both men are not conceding to, to get pushed back. Um, I just think that Tyson's more versatile. So which way the fight goes, whether he goes on the front foot, where he goes on the back foot, I think that, he's more comfortable and more versatile than, than Joshua. But I certainly think Joshua is shown, showing improvements. Taylor and Ramirez, two undefeated fighters, at the top of their game, tough fight. Yeah, if Josh goes about it the right way, I think it's a potential showcase performance and I think you'll you'll chin Ramirez. Canelo and Saunders, we've already touched on it, but I know he's a good friend. I know we speak about the tactics and stuff, but can he win? 100% he can win. Um, and if he does it correctly, I think it could be a real, quite a solid performance. Like not a really hugely questionable type win. I think even if he goes through spells of not doing the right thing, I think that he can still win, just makes it a bit closer. It's just, Canelo, he fights a lot with his presence, uses his presence and his aura. Um, and the sharp change of tempo that he gives you people hugely bite on. And depending on your reaction, he then makes you pay for overreacting. But because of who he is and how clever he is, he sort of plays on that. And people end up overreacting like, oh, this is kind of, oof, oof, and then end up leaving gaps. And he's very, very smart at exploiting those. Mm -hmm. Going forward for the future, brother, what's your plans? Just like my passion is, like I say, it's not it's not about me like, oh, I want to achieve this, I want to achieve that. It's just every fight I work with, I want to see them be the best that they can be. Do you ever give yourself credit? In terms of... Just stick, taking a step back and realising what you're achieving? Yeah, but this is my thing, like... This is my thing. I think... Like, I see it like this, like, my job is sharpen the tools and help them select the tools that they need for that job. Um... They're the ones that go out, got to go out and do it. So I always think that all the credit should go to the fighters. Um, do you feel as if you're proving, constantly trying to prove people wrong because of your age as well? I just think that you're always going to get that. Oh, it's because of this, oh, it's because of that. And funny enough, something that you mentioned before about uh, don't talk bad about people who don't this, don't that. Like, it's so easy. I see it all the time, these coaches and people getting on the camera, giving it the tough guy talk like, I don't do that, but I think people then associate with, oh, he's just a yes man. I don't need to improve in front, prove in front of the camera that I can be disciplinary of top level fighters. Um, I just don't get all that, the whole, I'm the tough guy. And, you know, it's just, it's about the fighters, you know, you don't need to try and create a certain persona. I often find that 
a weakness when I see that sort of stuff. Yeah, of course, because silence is golden as well, and it's mm. a sense of professionalism just to say, okay, and what happens is you prove people wrong in your results. I believe the weak talk and the strong proof and lead by example, which is, again, separates the winners from the losers, but it can be difficult, especially if you're in this alpha male environment, every, everybody's pumped up and somebody's talking shit then it is easy to try and defend. Yeah, again, and exactly. I think that's the key part of when people say about our oh, old head and young shoulders. Like that, that is for the boxers. Like oh, people get carried away and yeah, I need to be, I need to be yeah, like, sitting at I'm first the coach. Conferences if anything, shit. I need to be the, the one that says to the fighter, don't get too emotionally involved. That'll end up being used against you. Be cool, calm, collected. This is what you need to do. Don't need to talk bad about everybody. Time and place where you may think, do you know what, you can get in this fighter's head. But there's a time and place when you go, do you know what, by not doing nothing, he's going to do more. Um, and it's just so important not to get emotionally involved in boxing. Yeah, that can be difficult. But Ben, for coming on today, brother, and telling your story, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Can't wait to see what you do for the future. Can't wait to see Josh's fight, Billy Joel's fight, and Tyson's fight, and hopefully Saudi Arabia in, in July. That's what we're hearing, yeah. Yeah, hopefully it gets done. And But, brother, no, honestly, thank you. No, thank you. Great coach for all my achievements, and God bless you. And, Look forward to your future. Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.